Sunday. 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 Standing. So let's sing together. Let's praise the Lord. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You're the God of miracles, risen and invincible. Nothing is impossible. Awesome God, such strength born in weakness. Your light lights the darkness. You died and rose, a miracle. Awesome God. Nothing is impossible, nothing is impossible for you. You're the God of miracles, risen and invincible. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible for you. There we go. There we go. Good morning. Ah, we'll get to that here in a moment. Ah, you guys, have you ever had a, a great day and then you get to the end and it's terrible? Something happens? Yeah? Well, that was kind of like us last night. We had a great weekend camping and then we, Danny and I, head home and our car just dies. They're in Ilia Rome. We're at a traffic light, and then it just the dashboard turns on like a Christmas tree. All the lights and the battery is just like mm, mm, I can't, I can't. And it's like we were. I was very thankful. The traffic light went through three green lights and didn't change red. And it's like God was telling me, dude, you need to do something. And he's like, I'm not going to let you go until you make up your mind what you're going to do. Because you're in trouble right now. And you need to do something. So thankfully, I just turned. It was Cemetery Road, the Sheets, Sheets Station right there. And uh, barely made it to park. Um, I just wanted to go home, take a shower, relax. And now we're calling AAA. Um, so we got to hang out with Brandon, who is uh, what was our tow truck driver. He came. They told us it's going to be an hour to be sitting there. He came in 10 minutes, got us out of there. Uh, he goes to church in Circleville with his wife. He um, works uh, all week, but Monday and Tuesday, because that's when he has time to spend with his wife, who is disabled. So I told him, you were our angel tonight. And uh, when Danny was recounting to mom the events, he said, well, this is what we did during the camping trip. And then I got to ride in two Ford trucks. I've never ridden two Ford trucks, and this time I did. So it was an experience, and that just gives you perspective on you know, 
Maybe it's not what you were planning, but that's what God had, and I'm thankful for that. So if you remember Brandon and his wife in your prayers, you can do that. Um, but my wife sends me texts with um, Bible, and that's probably one of the best ways that you can encourage anyone. But wives to husbands, if you want to encourage your husband, send him messages with Bible in them, and that's going to be very encouraging because there's nothing more encouraging than God's Word. And uh, she sent me one that said, trust in the Lord in all your ways. So that's what we need to do every day, just trust in Him. Our ways are not His, but He knows better, and uh, I'm thankful for that, and I'm humbled that He is still teaching me. Um, but then now I have a word for you today. The word is Hosanna. Do you know what that means, Hosanna? No, everybody say Hosanna. Hosanna. Do you know when in the Bible you can find that, or where in the Bible you can find that word? David. In the New Testament, yes. And what, what was going on around that? Levi. Jesus was riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, yes. And then the people came out. And they were waving what? Palm branches. And they were laying down what? Their coats and their capes. So Jesus would go like in a carpet, on a carpet, um, because that was a way to show that they were wanting him to be their king, right? And they used this word, Hosanna. But what does Hosanna mean? What does Hosanna mean? We, we know that probably it was good because they were not going to be shouting bad things, right? It was good. So a lot of people think that it, it means, what's that? Yeah, a lot of people mean, they think that it means praise God or worship to God or praises. But it actually comes from, they were using it in, in the Old Testament. And this is Psalm 118 that says, Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. And um, it's two words, Hosanna. The first one, I'm not going to get too much into it quickly, but here we go. Um, the first one is uh, Yasha, Yasha. That hos, hos part is Yash or Yasha, and that's where we get the, the name Joshua or Jeshua, or Jesus. That's where he gets his name. And the other part is Anna, which we get the name Anna. And that Anna means, in a way, could be give us grace or give us your favor. But in another way, it means also we beg you. So what they were telling him is, you're the Savior we beg you to save us. We want you to listen to us and save us. And that's what they were shouting. And that was why it was controversial in that, in that passage, if you read it. But then if you read Psalm 118, you would get a little sense of that same urgency of victory and getting out of, of oppression and, and God saving them. Um, it's a really good psalm. Everybody gets all about 119. Psalm 119 is the cool one, the longest verse or chapter in the Bible. Read 118. I like the prequel. Prequel is good in this case. It's good. So give it a read. Okay. So that's as much as I'm going to say about that because uh, Pastor Brian has a lot more to say. But I do have certain things. We have Holy Week at Journey. This week is Holy Week, and we're so excited about it. Are you excited? Are you excited? Are you excited being part of Journey? I know you are, but what are they? Okay, first thing, we start, we kick it off on Wednesday. We're going to have our worship night, Wednesday, the 20-something of March, at 6.30. So we're going to come, and we're just going to worship the Lord. That's all we're going to do. We're going to pour our heart to Him, led by Felix. We're going to pray a lot. Um, by the way, pray for uh, Carol's mom. 
Bill just told me she's in the hospital right now, so that they need to keep her there. Uh, just pray for her, talking about prayer. Uh, just wanted to throw that in there. But we're going we're gonna to start that. So praying, worship night, come and join us. It's going to be great. Uh, number two, we have Friday, Good Friday service. That's our communion service. And that's also at 6.30 on Friday. This is not a service that we're going to come sit down and listen to anything. We're going to come and we're going to share communion. So you, the service goes from 6.30 to 7.30. You can come at any point during that time and have communion. We'll have the elements here and you can have your time of communion and worship to the Lord um, individually by families. And then you may go and keep celebrating and then we go on Saturday, and Saturday we have our community Easter egg hunt um, at the corner of Buckboard Lane and Willow Creek, and that's where Mr. Stan and Mrs. Crystal um, live, and we're going to do it there in their backyard. They have a huge backyard, and we're going to lay the eggs there. There are invitations. Take some. They're at the, at the dream uh, table. Take one. Invite somebody. Okay, there, there, and thank you everybody that brought eggs. We are right now at over 3,000 for sure. Maybe we are up to 4,000 eggs, so that's going to be excellent. Uh, how about that, Danny? Making you proud? <laughs> excellent. Um, but yeah, take an invitation. Today we're going to have a little meeting. If you want to help there at the event, um, just go to the address and we'll meet there right after church, and we'll go over the things that we're going to be doing. I'm going to be there just making sure that I know what and where we're going to put everything. And uh, But that's on Saturday. And then we close with a big golden bow on Sunday of Easter. And uh, we also have invitations. That is next Sunday at 10 a.m. Make sure that you take also an invitation there at the Dream um, table. And then you can invite somebody. We, we want to, it, it's a great opportunity to invite people. Also, if you are new here, if this is your first, second, or third time here, and uh, we want to connect with you. So we have the Discover table, and just grab a little card there. Um, just give us your name, your email address. We want to make sure that um, you know what's going on. We keep you on in in the loop. Uh, Kevin is going to be standing there. If you have questions, you can ask Kevin. He's going to be standing there by the table. It's the first of the three tables. And uh, you can talk to him, or you can talk to Pastor Brian, or me. You can talk to anyone. We talk to everybody. Just talk, okay? All right, but for now, I think that's all. I went a little long, sorry. But it's okay. It's okay. You guys are used to it. Well, there's a lot of stuff coming up. Come on, guys. All right. Let's pray. Let's get, give the Lord thanks for our uh, offering, for His grace and His mercy in our lives. Thank you, Father. Thank you for just allowing us to even come to you at any moment. Lord, you're there all the time, and we don't deserve it. We are nothing. And yet, in your grace and in your mercy, Lord... You give us what we don't deserve, and you don't give us what we do deserve. And we're thankful. And we want to just be here, present, willing, available, because it's the only thing worth doing, Lord. To serve you, to love you, to worship you. And one of the ways to worship you, Lord, is through our giving. We thank you today again for this offering uh, of my brothers and sisters, all of us coming together to give you this offering um, that can be used for uh, the expansion of your ministry, your, your message, the gospel, and to help others uh, see the light and uh, just to continue doing this service in this church, Lord. Uh, thank you for everyone here today, for those watching online also, uh, for those who are sick, uh, just be with them, Lord. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Let's stand. Let's welcome the Lord together. Welcome. 
this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonders and love. Give us a great place of a never changing God. Found in you, found in you, Jesus, every victory is found in you, found in you. Ah, 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 ah. Open wide our hearts now to yours. Every fear. a greater glimpse of a never-changing God. All we want and all we need is found in you, found in you. Jesus, every victory is found found in Jesus we are not dead in sin anymore but we are alive in Christ just our next song says we would be hopeless without God's goodness we would be desperate without his love we would be slaves to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross I would be hopeless Without your goodness, I would be desperate. Without your love, slave to the darkness. If it wasn't for the cross, you have won me with your kindness. Chase me down. I was lost, where would I be if it wasn't for the cross? Hallelujah, thank you Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, with your blood you bought my my 
shameless, met with mercy. Now your mercy will be my song in all the glory, all the power of the cross. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. I'm healed by your death I live the power of sin is overcome it is finished it is done by your stripes I'm healed by your death I live the power of sin is overcome it is finished it is done by your stripes I'm healed by your death I live Sin is overcome, it is finished, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner, now I'm not. With your blood, you bought my freedom, hallelujah. For the cross, hallelujah.
quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead are raised to life, finished the victory cry. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Savior. No one could have saved us but Jesus. No one. We are not perfect or spotless or holy, but you, you make us to be these things by your grace. Now we can live with the assurance that our names are written in the book of life. And no one, no one, no one can take that away from us. Thank you for Jesus who purchased our pardon, who gave us his righteousness through his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, I pray that you lead us so we can dedicate our lives and our salvation completely to Jesus, letting the world see his life and his character in all that we do. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There are certain things that are just easy to talk about. Uh, maybe, maybe you are somebody who's into basketball, and right now this is your time, right, for college basketball. Was anybody pulling for Oakland? Anybody pulling for Oakland? Right? So pretty, pretty uh, awesome story there. And uh, just so I'm, I'm from Indiana, all right? Born in Iowa, but really raised in Indiana. Uh, I who's your fan? So we never root for Kentucky, all right? So that's that's just a rule. That's just a rule. I noticed, uh, I noticed that after Oakland beat Kentucky, that there was just this run on their merchandise, and there was eight thousand dollars quickly bought shirts, different things from Louisville. So Indiana may not like them, but Louisville even dis dislikes them even more. So I'm pretty sure you're going to see a lot of Oakland shirts the first time that uh, th this next year when those two teams play each other. But there's, there's lots of things we, we, are ju we just find so easy to, to talk about and, and just laugh about at times. But there are other things that are challenging as well, right? And so I, I threw it in and put it out there for the experts. I, I just searched the internet. And so I found uh, some things that, that honestly, at times we've, we just find a hard time talking about, uh, maybe because of complexity, sensitivity, personal discomfort, whatever it may be. But here are the things that, that uh, the internet threw out there at me. It was mental health issues. Sounds about right. Grief and loss existential questions. Honestly, I just like the fact that I got to say existential uh, today in the sermon, but just talking about the meaning of, of life, uh, nature of reality, uh, personal trauma, uh, taboo subjects, sexuality, religion, politics, uh, death. Seems like we've talked about all of those, but anyways, uh, ethical dilemmas, intangible concepts, 
their definition was trying to articulate abstract concepts like love, beauty, or consciousness, which I, I found to be kind of interesting because abstract in the fact that they don't have a definition for those things, yet we do. Uh, personal identity, addiction, recovery, interpersonal conflicts. Again, I, as I went through that list, I'm like, man, we talk about quite, we talk about all of these things. As a matter of fact, here, even since I've I've been here, but there certainly are things that we just struggle at times to to convey, uh, to talk about, to to really dive into, and certainly one of those things I I think even for us as believers. Uh, can struggle with talking about it. And as a matter of fact, I, I wonder how many people, uh, feel free to tell me at the end of the sermon, not during, okay, no text, but would just be the fact of how many of you have actually had a conversation with somebody who was outside of the kingdom, who was not a Christian that you talked about this with. But instead of just uh, loading us up here, how about if we just dive into the scripture here and look at Matthew 8, Verse 28 is where we find ourselves at uh, this morning. It says this, When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gardenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out, went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. You know, we've seen Jesus' power in action as we've been tracking through here in this eighth chapter of of Matthew. We've seen him uh, overcome disease, physical deformity, uh, even have control over the natural world. And Next, Matthew then uh, shows Jesus' control over the the supernatural world. In in Mark and and Luke, there's a very similar story, uh, but there's only mention of of one demon-possessed man. Here in Matthew, we we have two. I'm not sure if it's just the, the same story. Maybe it's the fact that in those accounts, they really just took the person who was more of the spokesperson uh, for that. It could be the fact that this is one of these things that happened to Jesus on a number of occasions, maybe even in some of the very similar places. I I certainly know this. You and I recognize uh, from John just the very fact that John 21, 25 says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written, right? So Jesus performed miracle after miracle after miracle, and we, we only have a small portion of, of what that is, and certainly some of those would be uh, quote-unquote repeats uh, as far as uh, overcoming some of the same things. But I think we can acknowledge this, and, and this is kind of where I was setting this up, but the whole subject of, of demonology or, or demon possession well, those can be difficult subjects to approach. I know in Jesus' world, and honestly still in our world today in many parts, uh, the most natural explanation for any of this, some evil force or forces, has taken over another person. Uh, many today, certainly with our understanding of uh, modern medicine, would kind of take all of these things and and just say that was just a reference to, to mental illness or some certain disease. And maybe that could be the case in, in certain instances as, as we're reading the Scripture. But not in this situation. I mean, all of a sudden you, you have these, these, these two demon-possessed people who they speak to Jesus directly. But not only that, but they... They know who Jesus is. More so 
as we've been discovering, more so than even his own disciples, at least at this point in the game. See, the devil knows who Jesus is. And Jesus certainly was also quick to recognize the, uh, the devil's uh, agents. So could it be? Could it be that some mental illnesses are demon possession? I'll say this. Certainly Scripture would certainly open the door for, for some mental illnesses to be dem- demon possession. Again, maybe that's hard for some of us to grasp and and maybe some of us just struggle with, with thinking in, in those terms. But in the, di- in the Bible, we certainly see demons attacking people, attacking people spiritually, attacking people mentally, attacking people physically. Uh, in the spiritual realm, they, they promote false religions and demon worship and the occult. In the intellectual and, and psychological realms, they, they promote such things as false doctrines and insanity. And... If we look in Mark 5, masochism, this, this demon-possessed man who, who gashed himself with stones. Or at times they would have the inability to speak or, or even uh, a suicidal uh, mania. While the Bible clearly speaks of demon possession and its effects, it doesn't always, doesn't always really tell us uh, what the degree of control that these demons have. Scripture doesn't always distinguish between being possessed or, or obsessed or oppressed by demons. And just for the record, just, just in case this pops up in your mind, it's just the fact of, listen, if you are already possessed by the Holy Spirit, right? If you've given your life to, to Jesus Christ and are indwelt then by the Holy Spirit, you can't be possessed then, certainly by a a, a demon. But that doesn't mean Satan will leave you alone, right? Didn't leave Jesus alone, tempted him, and he certainly will do the same thing for you and for me. It's interesting to note here that there isn't a case, somebody prove me wrong, there isn't a case of, of demon possession seen in the city of Jerusalem. I think then, as in now, the aspect aspect of Satan's work seems to appear more commonly, right, in rural, more unsophisticated areas than maybe the urban. It's more common to hear of it where there's uh, animalistic religion or it's uh, accompanying fear and and the worship of, of evil spirits. In more advanced societies, a person who is seriously deranged possibly even by, by demons, it's, it's likely just to be considered that they are insane and that they would just be put into a mental institution since certainly there's nothing medically they can do about that. And in this case, it seems certain that, that there are some people that are diagnosed as mentally ill that actually probably then are demon-possessed. We see in, as Jesus arrives here, that these demon-possessed men, they, they come out of these tombs, right? The, the, the graveyard. The, all of a sudden, there's this, these hills, and they would had, have caves where they would uh, dig out uh, from that and, and, and use that as, as a cemetery. So these guys, they, they come out of the tombs, and they approach Jesus, and, and we're told that these men are so violent and that they would accost anyone who would pass by that and people, honestly, they just stop going that way. But these demons, these demons who are used to striking fear in others, they become fearful themselves in this moment. You see, they recognize Jesus right away for who he is. Interestingly, as we saw last week, after seeing Jesus quiet the storm, his, his own disciples ask one another, what kind of man is this? And now we get the answer, and from a most surprising source, Jesus, the two demon-possessed men, yell out, is the Son of God. Uh, later, this, this same phrase will be used by his disciples as a whole, and certainly more specifically by, by Peter himself. But, but it's ironic that the, 
the first people to address Jesus in this way do so under an evil influence. But Matthew would have us understand that demons, while evil and destructive, they have, as it were, some inside information about the spiritual reality around us. You see, demons, after all, they are they're fallen angels. There was once upon a time when they, they knew Jesus. They hadn't seen him ever take on flesh before now that he is all man at the same time being all God. But they had spent, they had spent much time with Jesus in heaven before they rebelled and were cast out. And so they knew exactly who they were talking to in this moment. And yeah, they were scared. They were scared. They knew Jesus, the Son of God, had the power over them and could destroy them at any moment. And they knew that He was the Messiah, the the promised one, the one who would come to judge and put all wrongs right. That is why the demons instantly suspect that they're in trouble in this very moment. And they are, in a sense, right. Jesus has come, indeed, to come put the forces of evil to flight. And what happens to these demons entering into the pigs and then driving them into the lake is is a sign of what Jesus will do in his death, in his resurrection, with all evil, whatever sort. So in desperation, these demons look for a means of escape, and they see the pigs, right? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. The sense here is not if, right, you drive us out. It's since. It was a foregone conclusion. This was the end of them possessing these men. They knew they were about to get, so to speak, kicked out. And so they, they begged they begged Jesus, send us, send us into the pigs. Why pigs? I can't be certain about this, but certainly maybe they, demons, maybe they have an affinity uh, with pigs since they were listed as unclean animals. As a matter of fact, to Jews, probably the un, uncleaniest, is that a word? <laughs> of all the unclean animals. Uh, Look that up for me in the dictionary later and and don't tell me. But the scripture goes on to say that Jesus just said to them, go. Go. And so they came out, went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water with a word from Jesus. A single word from Jesus. That's all it took One word, and the demons have no choice but to leave these men that they had been possessing, and then they go into these pigs. The the pigs immediately panic and rush down the steep bank into the lake, and they drown. Not a great plan, honestly. Not Not a great plan. I think the, the, the demons chose poorly here, uh, but desperate times, right, lead to sometimes some desperate measures and possibly don't think this one completely through. Fear will do that to you, right? Even demons who are afraid for their own well-being. And so those attending the pigs, right, Scripture says those attending the pigs ran off, went to the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Incredible. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. You know, chances are these pigs, chances are these, these pigs could have been pigs who were being illegally raised, If Jesus was predominantly ministering with Jews, then in all probability, these Jews were doing something they weren't supposed to be. And if they are Jews here, maybe this is why we don't 
while they plead with him to leave, they, they don't ask for any restitution, right? For the loss of all of this wealth, money, right? These pigs dying at this very moment. Because it's pretty hard to ask for restitution for animals. You can't take a person to court to get money from another person if what you're doing is illegal, right? So I'm, I'm in seminary. So going to graduate school and seemingly almost every semester I had a different job because I wasn't there for whatever job it was that I was doing except for I was working at church. They don't pay very well. So I, I was also trying to work another job to, to be able to actually, well, eat. Uh, my wife, I don't know, for some reason, she's so picky about that. And uh, so I was working a job and one of those was I, I delivered pizzas for Mr. Gaddy's. Anybody ever heard of it? Okay, southern thing. So, Mr. Gaddy. So, here I am, I'm, I'm delivering these pizzas. Great place for a seminary student, for sure, because I don't know what the deal was here, but a couple of the guys had spent time in prison. One was a safe cracker, a real thing. Uh, another person, well, let's just say he was in prison. Uh, and then I had another person, he was in, uh, he was younger, so he was in uh uh, a halfway house, um, and then there was a, a Wiccan uh, guy as well there. Anyways, it was, a, it was just a, I don't know what taught me more that semester, Mr. Gaddy's <laughs> working with these guys or the seminary professors, but as I was uh, working there, you know, just became friends with, with some of these guys. Uh, a couple of them came to know Christ uh, during my time there as well, but before that happens... <laughs> All of a sudden, this guy pulls up his car to the, uh, to the store, and they ask me to come out. And so I, I come out, and they, they open up the, the trunk to this, their car. And all of a sudden, they got all kinds of things there. And one of the things was a tennis racket, and they knew I played tennis. And they said, hey, Brian, we just wanted to give you this tennis racket. And I said, where did you get that tennis racket? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's just like a smorgasbord of different things here. Where did you get the tennis racket? I said, well, we, we stole it out of this car. And they're like, but it's okay. No, no, you don't have to worry about it because there was also a bunch of drugs in this car. So that guy's not calling the cops, <laughs> right? I'm like, I, I'm going to let you guys keep the tennis racket. <laughs> All right, that's, that's what I did. But if you're doing something wrong, you're not going to uh, be able to go to the authorities uh, for, for help. And certainly these guys weren't going to be able to do that either. But how does everyone react to Jesus in this case? You see, what we've seen so far is that wherever Jesus went, that, that all of a sudden he would do something miraculous and, and people would just come out of nowhere bringing more and more people that, that, that they might find a cure as well. But not in this instance. If, if you think about the owners of the pigs, right? I mean, <clears throat> their bottom line took a hit, right? Uh, I, I mean, all of a sudden here, you know, people are, they're always happy to see someone doing something great, something kind for someone else, uh, well, until it bothers you, <laughs> until it affects you, especially financially. I, I remember reading, speaking of seminary, I remember being in class and reading about the Great Awakenings and so many people came to know Christ all at one time, and there was a, a couple of different stories and occasions of, about just the fact of so many people would come to know Christ that all of a sudden, people would just stop drinking, drinking alcohol, and bars would just literally close, like, like they're not in business anymore. And, and I, I was thinking about that, and I, I was thinking, I bet you the bar owners weren't too happy about that. I never re re remember reading any stories about that. And in our day and age, if that happened, the government actually would not be too happy about for, from the loss of all the taxes uh, that, that they receive from that. I, I, just, I just know this is that too many people care more about their money, their wealth, their stuff than human souls. At times we get so wrapped up in just us, our stuff, that we, it's so hard for us to, to look out, especially if it costs us something. 
to be able to help others. And so I, I think as we look at the owners of the pigs, we can, we can see why they were wanting them to leave. But, but what about the townspeople that come out? I mean, I don't think it was about the pigs to them personally, right? I mean, it didn't hurt them any. I, I don't think it was about the demon-possessed men. I mean, the, their, their take on all of this, their, what was most important to them in all this, in this story to, to these townspeople, wasn't the fact of there was these two guys that used to be completely out of control, that literally took away a whole part of their region where people couldn't go, and now it's safe, and these guys are healed. And that's not what's on their lips, not what they care about. Because they ask him to leave. And I think a reason for why these, these townspeople ask him to leave is upon entering Jesus' presence, they become frightened. I mean, would you come face to face with Jesus, the Holy One, you're frightened. Just for lost people to become frightened when they see Jesus? No, I'm going to say for everyone. To be face to face with the Holy One. I, I say that because, do you remember Isaiah? A prophet? A man of God? That when he comes face to face with God, even he is scared. I mean, he's scared to death in that moment. He thought, this is it. I'm, well, I'm, I'm really about to see Jesus, right? I'm really about to see God here in, in this moment. But what we know about Jesus in the scriptures is so many times that when people would come and they would meet him, they would be in awe. And all in the sense of, man, how incredible is Jesus. But all in the sense of just downright frightened of who he was. There's just, in Scripture, you don't get a, a whole lot of sense as we do in the world today that, that so many times he was just a, a teacher amongst other teachers. He was a force to be reckoned with. You might follow him, you might be scared stiff of him, but you couldn't ignore him, is what we see time after time after time in Scripture. And, and this is the same Jesus. This is the same Jesus that you and I are to follow today. The one who brings awe in, in the sense of, of just reverence and respect. But yeah, I, I think also a fear. I, I don't know about you and, and your relationships with, uh, with possibly your dad, uh, certainly in, in my family. Uh, man, I love, loved, love, love still today uh, my dad and just um, knew that he cared for me, knew that he loved me uh, and just had this, this uh, I, I was at times in awe of my dad, right? He was so strong. I, I just I always just remember how, how incredibly strong this guy is. And how weak I was, still am, but I was also scared of him, <laughs> right? I mean, mom could, mom could shout all she wanted down the hall for me to get up, and I'm still sleeping, right? I'm like, basically, mom shouting down the hall. That was, that was the original snooze alarm, right? <laughs> Dad, Dad didn't have to say a thing. I could hear dad's footsteps. And when I heard dad's footsteps, I was on the edge of my bed, right? Good morning, sir, right? What? Was I afraid? You bet I was, <laughs> right? I knew dad wasn't just going to let me stay there and sleep. That's the God we serve. There is this awe that, that we are to have towards him. That's the Jesus that we must follow today. That's, that's the Jesus that we need to communicate, that we need to make known to the world around us. You see, Jesus has authority. Jesus has authority. Uh, the, the point, the whole point 
of this, this chapter 8, really, is just the fact that Jesus has authority. Even, even, before, even before that, right, Jesus has authority to teach people, right, as, as we saw in the Sermon, in the Mount, Sermon on the Mount uh, even a year ago. Also, he has the authority over diseases, whether, whether they be right there in front of him or even at a distance, right? He has authority over the lives of people who want to follow. He has authority over the winds, the waves, even of a lake. And now we see that he has authority over the shadowy forces of evil demons themselves. We come to understand that Jesus has authority over everyone and everything. And that's what we need to know, to understand, to embrace as we follow Jesus Christ ourselves. He isn't just somebody with good ideas. He isn't just somebody who will tell us how to establish a better relationship with God. He is somebody with authority over everything that the physical world on the one hand and the non-physical world on the other can throw at us. This is This is a Jesus that we can trust with every single aspect of our lives. Hear this, hear this. There is nothing, there is nothing that you are going through that Jesus doesn't have authority over. Nothing. Nothing that you've ever experienced, nothing that you ever will experience, nothing that you're ever going to go through that Jesus doesn't already have authority over. Yeah, there's things out of your control. Yeah, there are forces at work that certainly are trying to harm you, but nothing is out of God's control. And and not only that, He cares for you, loves you. Something interesting that I've just noted as, as I've been reading through this, is the fact of when he casts these demons out of these two guys, you don't have a sense where he blames them for them being demon-possessed. When he has healed everyone thus far, you, you don't get the sense of just for the fact of it's Jesus blaming them for, for being in the situation that they are in. We do that. We do that far too often, blame people for the, the situations that they find themselves in. And truth be told, at times we, we do put ourselves in those situations. But Jesus just simply healed those that he came across. And he had compassion on them. He saw them as, as people who had been overcome, struggling. And since he could, he did. He he would heal them. I don't know. I don't know what all maybe you're struggling with today. But I know Jesus has the authority over whatever it is. And like you, listen, I, I wish, selfishly, I wish that meant that our struggles then would be short, quickly removed. But as we've seen here in the past, even last week, that while God may not bring some of the struggles that we face in, in our lives, he certainly has a way of using them for his glory, for our good. You could say, literally, his authority knows no, no bounds. And I guess I just did just say that. His authority has no bounds. So God can and does often choose to use his power, his authority, and take away the struggle. But God also chooses to use his power, his authority, to build our faith through the very struggles that you and I face. And God, in and through whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, he promises to what? Never leave us. He promises to never forsake us, that he is always going to be there with us that we never face our struggles alone. 
Man, isn't that, isn't that just one of the lies of the devil? One of the ways in which he influences us, even as believers, to tell us that when we are struggling with somebody, nobody struggles like you are. And maybe that's true. But that bigger lie is, you are all alone in this. And that is not the truth. That God is there with us in the struggle. Is this the Jesus you know? Again, the disciples were were finding out more and more about who this is that they were choosing to follow. They, They didn't just automatically understand everything there was about Jesus, and so many times neither do we. Is this the Jesus that you know? I just know this, is that you and I, we, we, need to, we need to learn to lean into this Jesus together, even with others. And yes, yes, maybe there'll be times when we will, we will have to simply go it alone with just Jesus and ourselves, with nobody else. But again, you have people all around you that would love to walk alongside you and to help you through the struggles in which you find yourselves in if you'll open yourself up. Open yourself up to the Lord and the Lord's people. I think we can find much more help for the struggles that we find ourselves in in these, at times, difficult, difficult days. Let's stand. Father God, we thank you so very much for truly the love that you do have for us. And God, we recognize that you don't just love us and can't do anything about it, but that you are ever at work in our lives, helping us, helping us through some storms in life, at times, the allowing that storm to, to help shape us, to help us become more, well, more like you. At other times, God, just stilling the storm with a word, go. God, you have authority. I pray it starts in our own lives. I pray we recognize your authority over us, not just the world that we live in, but we open ourselves up to you completely. Not just recognizing, but living within that and allowing you to shape our lives the way in which you see fit, which is scary for all of us. But God, you have said that you would be with us in the midst of whatever it is that people might be facing here today. They do not face that alone. Let us never buy into the lie that we are alone. Because if we know you, if if we have responded to you in faith, God, you you, you possess us. And you help us to move forward no matter what comes at us. Whether natural or even supernatural, you help us to move forward. And so God, we, we look to you today as our source of power, as our source of strength. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's worship. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. With your blood you bought my free.
You know, I'm pretty excited uh, for, this, for this past week and just in, in the way in God, God is just moving in, in our midst and just helping us to, to uh, discover, dare, dream. And, I, you know, Monday we were able to just bless all the businesses here on, on our street with a bunch of cookies. Thank you for everybody who, who baked uh, some, some cookies. Uh, and I tell you what, we, we put on the little card about Journey Church and just who was giving them the cookies that the basic ingredients was, uh, let's see if I get this right, uh, flour, sugar, and a pinch of joy, all right? And so I, I just say this, uh, just thank you for uh, Kevin and Susan and, and uh, for Barry uh, for uh, really putting in more than a pinch of joy uh, as, as you delivered those cookies uh, this, this past week as I was frantically trying to wrap cookies. Uh, that's cellophane wrap? I don't get that all the time, all right? So <laughs> anyways, <laughs> Lord help me. So that is not my strength. What a great way for us to just love on people that are around us. And, and I come in uh, that day, and all of a sudden there's all this food here. Uh, and so your small group was putting together packets yeah. of food for kids who were food for the weekend. For on the weekend for kids to get the school lunches, that kind of thing, right? So food insecure. Anyways, kind of a weird term, but that's what we use, isn't it? So uh, it just... Well, that was cool, right? I, I didn't even know that we were doing that. And, and we, we weren't. Uh, you were. So just thank you so very much for that. And, you know, Grant was uh, doing a, an auction for uh, all those that were uh, for Indian Lake. And so they raised 50000 for that. And I, I was just thinking, man, there's just all different kinds of things that surely I never even hear about uh, where you, as the Church of Jesus Christ, Journey Church, representing this church, our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, are making a difference in our world, that, that the dream is, is, is more than just a dream, but becoming a reality. And so I, I pray that you'll be with us this week as well. Uh, we'll have opportunities to, to just worship uh, our, our Savior uh, this, this Wednesday night. Uh, Friday, you'll be able to, to just come uh, whenever you can make it between 6.30 and 7.30 for for communion, and you can just uh, uh, come in and, and just kind of prepare your own heart, maybe just a, a little bit, uh, just quiet your soul there, and, and then take communion uh, before you go. And then that very next morning, we'll do a little Easter egg hunt. So thank you for all of, of you who have um, done eggs. And, you know, my, my wife has jokingly said the last... We did the last two weeks because we needed eggs. But for our small group, welcome to the sweatshop. Anyway, so I, I know we've done quite a few eggs. But uh, just thank you for everybody who has done that. And then we'll look forward to being here uh, Sunday. Honestly, as we just worship. Uh, I, every, 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 every week is incredible uh, for us as we worship our, our Savior. But feel free. Uh, these are great opportunities, though, right now to leverage what's going on in our community, uh, in our world, there won't be a lot of people who will just snarl at you as you invite them to church or, or certainly to an Easter egg hunt. And so if they have kids, uh, invite them, come out. And uh, listen, as far as I understand about Easter egg hunts, it really goes in about two seconds. So man, those kids are like they've never seen candy before. So it goes really fast, except for the little kids are, and they just literally just barely pick up an egg. They look at it, and you're just looking at the other area, and it's already done. And those kids are looking at that little kid area like, oh, man, let me in there. Anyway, so you, uh, you come and be a part of that. And then again, there's also these cards to invite people. Uh, so feel free, grab as many as you'd like uh, to pass out. And uh, let's Let's, let's fill the house for, for God's glory uh, this, this next Sunday. Love you guys, and we will see you this week, several times probably.